Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, a place to find connection and a sense of belonging, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we talk about sensitivity and the richness that it adds, the strengths we have because of our sensitivity, and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, I love this episode with Jen Perry. Jen Perry and I worked together almost a year ago to create the online HSP courses, and our friendship has just blossomed since then. And what I love about Jen, and I have this with a number of people in my life. So if I'm not talking about you and you know who you are, have faith in that. What I love about my relationship with Jen is that I can just show up and be wherever I am. And she really just holds space for me. And I wanted to have a conversation with her about why this is so important for us to have in our lives. I really want to break the shame around having intense feelings. I want to normalize it. As a therapist, break the shame for therapists because we can be judgmental. We're all human. Even if we're therapists, we still struggle with things. And I think that we have this belief that it's not okay to have struggles and we don't want people to know. And it really, it can create some suffering for us. And Jen and I talk about this, but Jen talks about human life is a struggle. And with wounding, we get to accept that wounding happens and we want to normalize suffering. We're going to have misunderstandings, miscommunications. That's part of the human experience. Jen talks about the goddess never not broken and that she knows that she's broken and she just recreates herself every day. We don't have this expectation that we're supposed to have it all together. This is just an incredibly healing episode. Jen talks about internal family systems and parts work. We talk about the difference of acting from that wounded part and speaking for that part. And she talks about what it means to be self-led. This is an ongoing process. It's not a one and done. And that's part of what I wanted to communicate in this episode. And I just talked about it in bonus episode 67. This is a little bit of a follow-up. I love Jen. If you're interested in hearing more with Jen, Jen and I did another episode, bonus episode 45 together. But again, I just want to emphasize that we're going to have struggles and there's nothing wrong with it. Now, I do have a disclaimer. We, when Jen and I talk, we, we don't talk cleanly and I am marking this episode as explicit. If you have kids in the car, this may not be an episode that you want to listen to. I don't think we drop any F-bombs, but we do say a couple of other words like shirt and H-E double hockey sticks if you're listening with somebody and you haven't had a chance to turn this off, I think there are maybe five times during this episode where we, we don't speak very cleanly. So let me tell you a little bit about Jen. Jen Perry, MSED, MA, LPC has been a psychotherapist for 20 years. She specializes in helping highly sensitive people thrive in love, work, and parenting highly sensitive children. Jen is passionate about using mindfulness and compassion-based approaches to ameliorate human suffering. Her contact information is in the show notes. You can learn more about Jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com. And I think you're going to love this episode. I just, it's such a real episode and I really love that about Jen. So now on to the show. Hey, Jen, welcome. Hi, Patricia. I am so excited to have this conversation with you today. You and I talk a couple times a week. You're the person that I reach out to when I'm struggling. I really feel like I could, I was trying to think of an example and it was so disgusting that I can't say it, but I feel like I could call you and tell you that I was going to do the most absurd, bizarre thing in the world. And you'd be like, oh, tell me about that. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Yes. Yes. And I would genuinely be very curious. Yeah. (laughs) And so I really, I think as highly sensitive people, we have these fears, like I can't share what's going on more than once. This is lasting too long. It's too intense. And what I love about our relationship is we're just so genuine and authentic when we show up and that we have really normal human struggles that we're very open with each other. And I think as therapists, we have a lot of shame around talking about like, we're therapists, we shouldn't struggle with this stuff. I mean, 
I kind of want to give you a chance to talk. So what do you think? Well, I just want to say just back at you how much I value and appreciate you and this relationship that we forged. And it's interesting because uh, mostly on Marco Polo, where we can be asynchronistic with each other because as busy professionals and, and you know, I, I know your kids are a little older. I still got two kind of, you know, middle-aged kids. It's, a, it's really challenging to find time to be in time together. So Marco Polo is asynchronistic. And I, I really appreciate being able to show up in that space as I am. And it, you know, I, I get so as HSPs, I wish everyone had a Marco Polo buddy. And, you know, it's an interesting thing that you're talking about the shame being a therapist. Uh, I know a lot of us are like, God, how can I show up for other people if I don't have my life together and we can get pretty judgmental and yet we're all human and human life has always been a struggle. We live in a society, we live in a culture where if it seems to be hard, maybe you're done, you've done something wrong or you're doing something wrong, which just couldn't be further from the truth. I, I talked to many adults who were like, it's almost like I missed that day in school where they told me how to adult and have a life and have it successfully. And if we're wobbling or uh, off balance or if something emotionally hits us, then we immediately freak out like we're doing something wrong. And one thing over the last year of uh, you and I really creating that space for each other. And, you know, it's funny, it really started when we were working on the HSP group together because we would show up ready to record our lessons for it. And inevitably, you know, having that space to be real, right? And so for us, that meant no professional veneer. I'm going to show up, put on the game face and follow through no matter what. That that was that was gone. We were we had lots of permission, lots of safety with each other to show up as we were. It makes me laugh now because anytime I don't feel like doing something, I can remember that. Remember giving each other the space to say, oh, hell no, I don't want to do this today. And yet that allowance, that permission, that yeah, right. I'm ready to go now. Once we were able to process and really be held and, you know, the exuberance. And I think that that comes through. I think anybody that's taken the HSP course sees the, the authenticity in our videos where we're presenting the material. And so using that kind of as a metaphor for life, it's interesting. So as, as therapists, I think the more real we can be, the better, the more permission our, our, our clients have to be real as well. So it's kind of like this twofold thing here. I know clients will want to put me up on a pedestal and they're surely like, they're like, well, Jen, you surely, you've been at this 20 years. You know, you, everybody knows what a geek I am and, and how often, how much I study. And I'm like, surely you have it all together. And I'm like, oh, 24 seven. Yeah, no, <laughs> I do not. And it's just, how do we embrace, especially as HSPs, our process, having big feelings and it not be wrong and it not mean, so this, this trick that I need to watch out for is, like the if only. Someday, if I just figure it out all right, if uh, I won't have to struggle, I won't have to be, have feelings. And I forget the woman's name. There's a TED Talk. I'll see if I can add it to the show notes later because uh, I do love to give credit where credit's due. She talks about, like, we don't want to have dead guy goals. We don't want to have goals where it would be easier for someone whose life is over to pull off than us. And I consider the biggest dead guy goal is not having feelings. I mean, if we think of our feelings and all of our big feelings as the soundtrack to our lives, right? So you listen, you watch a movie or a TV show. I'm totally in love with Outlander right now. You know, there's music there that adds to the vibration, the energy of the episode. And so when it's a scary scene, it's got scary music. When it's happy, it's got music. When it's sad, it's got certain certain emotional signatures portrayed in the vibrations of the music. And so can we see our emotional lives as as neutrally as a soundtrack and we just listen we just feel them and there's really nothing we overcomplicate things like there's really nothing more to do and when you have a beautiful witness like you and I have in the Marco Poloing that we do together it's just such a relief yeah and I think as highly sensitive people because most of us were not raised where it was okay to talk about feelings it wasn't okay to have feelings so we learned ways to mask that and to just kind of push through and when we find our tribe, when we either find a therapist or a coach or other HSPs, a partner, a friend who's done their work and we can show up and be mirrored, I mean, it's about us owning our traits and being okay with it. And vulnerability is about 
being really uncertain and having things going on and not being in a place where I know what's going on, but something's going on, which is the power of being around at least one other person that can really hold space for us and not tell us that we need to go to therapy or we need to be on medication. I mean, if you need medication, you need medication, but in response to sharing a genuine feeling and somebody tries to fix it, mask it, take it away, that just recreates that wounding from our childhood. And so it is so powerful to have, you know, one, two, three people in your life that have done their work or are doing their work that can really mirror that for you. I I think that's where the primary healing comes from. And I know in graduate school, we were taught to be a blank slate, you know, that we have all these quote professional boundaries. And what I find in working with my highly sensitive clients is that mirroring and it's really the self-disclosure of talking about appropriately mindfully about my struggles and what goes on with me, not making the session about me, but saying, just like you said, I've got struggles. I'm having a hard day. This is what I'm struggling with. That is where the healing comes. And I constantly have this negative chatter in my mind, like I have no boundaries and I shouldn't be doing this. And when I check in with my clients, inevitably they will say or send me a follow-up email. I just got one this morning of somebody saying, I love that you shared what went on with your son. It really helped me. I I just feel like it, it just is so normalizing to me. And so we have this real push pull around showing up authentically based on what many of us received in our training. Yet it seems to be exactly what highly sensitive clients are really looking for and craving. Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I could mirror everything that you just said. My clients really appreciate it uh, when I tell stories from my own life. And, you know, the one, the one like I guess check that I do that I think I would encourage, uh, you know, all therapists or teachers or anybody in a role like that is, you know, what, why are you disclosing this? And if it's in the service of normalizing or, you know, illustrating something for your client, it's not, it's not that kind of messy picture of now let me go, you know, (laughs) suddenly the session's about me or I'm going to do a lot of emoting. So, you know, I'm careful if it's, you know, uh, it's funny. I had a client very, you know, I mean, I love my clients. So it is a relationship, you know, and the people that I work with when there's a click there and it, and it's magical, like I know they love me too. I remember I had posted something about my dog passing. So like I was really, my dog, she was like my first kid. I lost her last August. He told, you know, he's like, ah, oh, you know, I saw your, your post and, and I'm so sorry about your dog. And I was able to talk about it, but I got to tell you that was a full month after my dog died. And so he w- came in because HSP is especially just so, so caring. And there's, there's that pull to take care of me. And, and I was like, no, no, actually that happened about a month ago and I've had plenty of processing and holding. So I appreciate the sentiment and the, and the, you know, the condolences and the sympathy. And I, I was not in a place where, cause if I had done that a month earlier, I probably would have, I wouldn't have been able to have this session. I would have been crying. So, you know, knowing that our clients can trust us to take care of ourselves so that by the time we've normalized something, it's, it's fully digested. You know, kind of leading into that question about the wounding. I know we, we we've been talking a lot ab- about this, and it's it's really acceptance that that wounding happens in in human life, and not making how we show up in the world about the wound, but rather how we've taken care of ourselves around our wounding. I hope that makes sense. Say that again, because it was really powerful. I just kind of jumped right into that. So, oh. Normalizing suffering is the first part of what we just talked about, right? The, we call that the first part of this podcast. And I want to I want to use that languaging, accepting that wounding happens. Now, of course, I'm, I'm a trauma therapist, right? And we want to ameliorate the suffering that trauma causes. But sometimes I think we take that just a little bit too far, as in we build up perfectionism, this ideal world where trauma should never, ever, ever happen to any, anybody. And if it does, and you're wounded, we over identify with the wound and we kind of lose ourselves in that, in that wounding instead of acknowledging and accepting human life is a struggle. Being birthed is traumatic. (laughs) You know, we come in, in, in a, uh, a pretty intense, bumpy roller coaster ride coming in. 
you know, and that it's, it's an inherent misunderstandings are an inherent part of being human, miscommunicating, having childhood experiences as we're half baked as small children, right? Our brains aren't fully developed until we're 26 years old, that we are, it's almost a setup that we are going to have confusing, painful, bewildering experiences with, you know, caregivers, parents who are going through their own stuff, right? And to whatever degree they can be there for us. And it's funny, I remember taking an infant massage class and having uh, my dear, my brilliant friend, Brittany, who was leading it, say, you know, you just have to really show up as a parent accurately, like 30% of the time. And I was like, don't you mean 70? You got that backwards, girlfriend. And she was like, no. She's like, I double checked it too. I wish I could get that, uh, the, you know, the resource material for that. I can probably look it up. I'll go ask Brittany. But it was fascinating, right? We we don't have to be perfect to be to be good. And we don't, we can heal, but our healing comes from how we hold our wounds and not an over-identification with the wound. Yeah. I I my taskmaster is on. I think it's Winnicott that talks about good enough parenting just needing to show up 30% of the time. I think that's the resource. Yes. You're absolutely right. Which yeah. totally takes us from the meat of what you're saying, but my detail oriented. <laughs> <laughs> now it's important. I know. That's wonderful. Back there in the Rolodex. Yeah. And and so I want to drop back to this idea that when we know that suffering is something that happens to everybody, and that our idea is that if we didn't suffer, then the if then that you were talking about, you know, if I only wasn't suffering, if I wasn't feeling anxious, if I wasn't feeling depressed, if I wasn't having these intense feelings, you know, then I would be happy, then I would be better. And I think that when we just what you said, normalize suffering, that it's just part of being alive, we create room for it. And then we don't fight it and resistance, resist it. Is it something I would choose? Like if I wake up and go like, do I want to experience depressed feelings today or joyful feelings? Well, obviously, I'd want to have joyful feelings. And there are times when we just have heavier feelings for, for lack of not knowing how to discuss it. We just go through cycles and periods, whether it's something is going on in our life that's creating stress or their health issues or hormonal issues or whatever it is. It could be a million things. If we're a complex houseplant, we just, we dry out. We need water. Right. right? It's like we just, it, it's the nature of life to deplete us in some ways. And so how do we restore? And I think that when we don't have safe places to talk about it, that's when the imposter syndrome comes in. Because if I'm having these really uncomfortable feelings, but I can't tell my colleagues, I can't tell my friends, I can't talk about it appropriately with clients. And so I'm putting on this everything is fine place. I start to crack on the inside because there's not a sense of authenticity. There's not a sense of being congruent. And I really have to end up kind of disconnecting from my authentic self, which is what happens with wounding in childhood if our parents aren't able to attune with us. So it's like we recreate that wounding all over again by not being there for ourselves and our feelings. Yes. Yeah. It does nest in like that. One of the, one of the, I think richest work that I I enjoy doing in therapy, both for myself and then being able to facilitate it with for other people. And I think that's as therapists, if we could just really own that we need these skills and these, these things as much. And, you know, I go, the best therapists go to therapists, and then we are able to in turn facilitate that healing for other people is a type of reparenting. You know, when you, when you uh, step into a full spiritual adulthood then you are able to do that for yourself and absolutely it's beautiful to be able to do it with another person, whether that's through Marco Polo (laughs) or through a group Um, I have some, you know, some, I know the HSP group is kind of more educational and more short term. I also have long term self compassion groups where the members really just once a week show up that in this way. And there's confidence in that too. There's like, look, we know each member's got this. So we're not going to over identify with the wound. We're going to hold them in their process and their breakdown, so to speak, for lack of a better word right now. But we are also going to hold them in their strength you know, we are going to see them in their wholeness and that this is a moment in the soundtrack 
So sometimes I'll put it like using, using the movie metaphor again, or, um, you know, like a TV show that's kind of very long term, like, I don't know, outlanders up to like, I don't know, 30 or 40 <laughs> uh, episodes at this point, like the characters are who they are, no matter what they're going through in any particular episode, you know, in some episodes they're on top of the world, shit's going great. And other times they are really having a hard time, but we see them in their wholeness and in their power because we know the full, you know, breadth of the script. So that perspective taking, and I think you and I really do this for each other beautifully in our poloing is that, you know, I can come in and, and cry and, and feel crushed by something because I do feel things deeply as an HSP and you will make space and you will validate that for me. And all the while, you know, that a couple episodes ago and a couple episodes from now, I'm going to be back in, in my strength. And, and, and you believe as much in that. I think that's really important to keep in mind that we don't over identify with the wound. So, so to use the TV metaphor, when we're over identifying with our moon, our, our wound, it's like we never get out of that episode where the bad thing happened. Yeah. I want you to talk a little bit more about this because this is something that I feel I, I, I'm having a hard time languaging it and I'm feeling really messy. And I really want to articulate the difference of like, you and I were talking before we recorded. And so I, I'm just going to take a risk here. Like I was saying, like, I'm my ideal client in the sense that, yes, I struggle with intense mood states. Yes, I have a lot of deep feels that go on, but I'm always able to own that this is what's going on. Not always, but enough of the time that I'm not in it. And I'm able to say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm feeling. This is what my gremlins are saying. So it's not that I don't struggle, but it's that I know that I'm struggling and I'm able to talk about it. And even if I'm having resistance, I can say I'm struggling with my resistance. I'm in my resistance, that I'm not living from that place of wounding, but I'm able to be in it and talk about it, which creates some distance from this is who I am. And, and there are times when I feel like I'm broken and how come I'm struggling? But again, I know that that's not what the reality is. And I'm really trying to figure out how to language this with other people because I I want people to kind of be able to make that distinction of am I living from this place of wounding or does it just feel like I have a lot of stuff coming up, but I'm able to own it and I'm moving through it and that's very different. Can you help me? <laughs> I will try. You know, as you were talking, something came to mind. Um, two things, two things come to mind. First, um, one of my favorite goddesses, okay, so I, I love comparative religion and, and spirituality. She's a Hindu goddess. She's not very well known, and I'm not going to try and say her Sanskrit name, but in English, she's the goddess never not broken. Never not broken. And the beauty in her is that she knows, right, that she recreates herself every day that she, it's it's in her very wounding is is her power to express herself she doesn't have this expectation that she's always going to have it together so the second thing that i wanted to say about that is we live our lives as verbs okay the buddha said right there is no enlightenment there's only enlightened action so we don't get to stamp ourselves as having achieved any one particular state dead guy goals right Oh, you know, just freeze it right there because I, <laughs> I got it, you know? So that would be static. We don't want to live our lives as nouns because we can't. So when we want to capture and pronounce ourselves as having it together, being emotionally stable, which would we mean what? I mean, what would that mean? What are we talking about here? That would mean a constant state. I mean, you're close there in San Diego, right? You get your nice, beautiful weather. <laughs> but it would be like expecting it to be a 70 degree day every day in sunny. And that's just not human life. It's not static. So I think a couple of things are going here. I think we, we bounce back between these two states. Oh, good. I got it all together. Now, if only I could just keep doing that forever, right? Versus, oh, shit, it all tumbled. And now I feel like I'm broken into a million pieces. Along with, we all have wounding. So can we just accept the wounding already instead of over-identifying with it? And then what are we going to do about it? This is where in our class, we have the how the hell are you check-in and we turn towards ourselves with compassion and care. What do I need today? And what I need today may be different than what I needed yesterday because I'm the goddess never not broken. <laughs> Meaning I'm always shifting. I'm always changing. I'm never together. I'm never static. 
thank God, because if I was, I'd be dead. And we don't want to have dead guy goals. Does that help? <laughs> yeah. It it does. And something popped up for me, and I feel like this is a risk to say it. And so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot for it. So when you when you talked about being the goddess of never not broken, if somebody is saying that is not me, I'm broken, I'm defective, there's no chance that that's me, you are coming from a place of wounding. To me, the distinction is if I said I feel broken, but I'm open to considering that maybe I'm not, that is coming from a place of being able to look at it and know that there's a possibility. For some reason, I'm having this really strong need to really come up with some ways to identify, are you stuck in your wounding or are you in a place where you're having your wounding and you're wanting to grow? I'm I'm nervous, like I'm looking at your face because we have video on. So what do you think about that? Well, I'm curious. Let's go back. Um, Never not broken means always broken. It's a double negative there. Mm-hmm. Right. So it means we've lo- we're not going to hold on to this idea that we're somehow going to be not broken. Right. So whole- wholeness as a human being is a sense of brokenness, meaning we change from day to day. We feel feelings deeply. Life happens to us and it is a struggle and it can be painful. So we're going to drop this illusion of, you know, I. I don't know. It's kind of like that story with the porcelain doll that never wants to do anything. She's going to stay up on the shelf because she's afraid to be broken. She doesn't want to have any scars. She doesn't want to be glued back together. And then in the story, there's an old clown, an old porcelain clown that's fallen over too many times to count. And he's all like shattered and glued back together, but he's living life fully. You know, so if we don't, if somehow th- there is no way to not be wounded, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm not sure if I want to make sure that, because again, it's part of human life. It's part of human nature to miscommunicate. So I'm not sure that I'm deeply hearing your question either. So we may be missing each other a little bit. And so when that happens, I like to just take a deep breath and it's totally okay. Yeah, yeah, there you go. It's totally okay for that to happen because human speech is limited. Language is limited. We're trying to put 360 degree experience into symbolic words, symbolic languaging. And we're going to miss the mark. So we're going to miscommunicate. So in every relationship, if we could start off by saying, sure, we are going to misunderstand each other sometimes. And that's okay. Let's just dig in instead of getting angry or hurt that someone doesn't understand us. Let's assume there are going to be moments where we're not going to understand, even though we're trying so hard. So I want to shut up for a little bit and hear you talk a little bit more because I'm not sure I'm fully understanding. I think I got tripped up with the double negative. And so I, I went into a little bit of embarrassment and shame when you said that a tolerable amount. So I'm I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky phrase. I mean, that's okay. I, I, yeah. And I've said every time I have an agenda, it trips me up. And so I'm owning that I have an agenda because I've really been wanting to delineate this idea of being like when we're stuck in our wounding and when we're wounded and we're acknowledging it and we're doing what we're open to the fact that we're wounded. And so maybe if I change the phrase to, if I said to somebody, what if we assume that exactly what's going on right now is exactly where you're supposed to be? If we're feeling like I should be earning more money, I should lose weight, I should exercise more, I should have a relationship, I should be more patient, I should be less emotional, whatever, whatever, fill in the blank for whatever that thing is for you. And if I were to say to you, what if you're exactly where you need to be right now and that there's nothing that you need to do? And we all have this, like, I I can almost feel it in my chest or my stomach, like (gasps) my to-do list, because it's always huge. If I were to say, what if right now you're exactly where you need to, to be, you're perfectly imperfect, there's nothing wrong, this is okay. And for somebody who would say like, that can't be true. The only way that I'm lovable and acceptable is if I were to do this, change this, be this. If you're, if you can't accept that statement on any level because you feel like you're so fundamentally flawed and there is no truth in that, that to me is coming from a place of wounding as opposed to that's hard for me to believe. I feel like I don't have any value and worth unless I produce, I accomplish, I lose weight, I, whatever that fill in the blank thing is. That's the distinction of saying I'm, I'm open to considering that. It doesn't mean that I have to accept it, embrace it, but it's acknowledging like, 
hmm, that's, that's a new thought that I'm really uncomfortable with, but I'm open to entertaining that. That to me is a difference of being stuck in our wounding and going like, hmm, okay, maybe that is true. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Well, it sounds like you're saying like there's just this, you know, when someone's really in a state of hopelessness, right? Yeah, and I, I think what happens is I, I, I hear a lot of HSPs in groups that I'm in. These aren't people that I'm working with personally, so I, if, if you're hearing me say this, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> you know, it's like I hate my sensitivity. People walk all over me. I can't find a partner. I can't find a relationship. Like this really place of stuck disempowerment, not a both and. And, and I, and it feels like people think that that's all about the trait of being highly sensitive. And I feel really kind of sad when I see that because it's, it's not about the trait. If we tease out all the wounding, we've got challenges with being sensitive. There are things that we need to work through and it's not like it's a perfect life. Everybody has stuff. Everybody has stuff. And I, I want to make that distinction about, is this about being highly sensitive or is this about being so stuck in your wounding that you're not able to see that there's something beyond that? Maybe you can talk a little bit. I mean, if you have something to say, but maybe I'm wondering if you talk about when we come from that wounded part as opposed to speaking for that part. Yeah. If that would add some clarification. I'm I'm looking at like this is something I'm wanting to work out so much and I'm looking at your face and I'm like, oh, I don't think I'm communicating very well. So I'm having this like discomfort. <laughs> <laughs> Which I can tolerate. You don't need to fix it. I'm just naming what's going yeah, on. We're yeah. like, do you get it? Yes. Yeah. I, I think I do. I mean, again, I'm gonna stand by that sometimes it takes a, a a little while to communicate clearly, and that's not you. It's also my hearing. And it's funny what you said about the agenda, you know, so, you know, some of the concepts that you're asking about come directly from IFS, Richard Schwartz's work, internal family systems. I love the love, love that model because I would say most of the emphasis, if um, the therapeutic process, if therapy is kind of stuck, um, they turn it back on the therapist and they find that the question becomes, you know, where's the therapist kind of stuck or coming from a part. So we have parts of self, right? And this is totally normal. I'm not saying multiple personality disorder. It's not even called that anymore. It's dissociative identity disorder, but that we have these sub-personalities. We're not mono-minded at all. And, you know, if you think about that, how often do you feel two ways about something? You know, you have two different parts that are having an inner conflict about something in your life. So it's very natural. So a part can despair, right? A part can really buy into the cultural narratives around perfection. In the work of IFS, what we want is we want to be what's called self-led. And what self is, is it's really the soul substance, that the presence, right? That clear, calm, creative space that we can get in when we're not particularly triggered. When we get triggered, a part will take over. And then we think all that part's thoughts and feel all that part's feelings and kind of run the narrative of that part. Right. And so I would look for there's a part of the person that's really buying deeply into this perfectionistic narrative. And for that part, it's very real. So when we speak from that part, it's like the part has control over our whole bodies and and it's just that part. And I'll ask people, you know, well, how do you feel towards that part of yourself that really buys into that narrative? And they'll be like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm just feeling this. And that's when I know that they're really blended with that part. And sometimes when they're able to say, well, you know, I feel bad for this part. This part really buys into it. Then I know that they've got a little perspective on their part and that self is there, that calm, compassionate presence. And really that's where we want to reparent from. And that's who we want handling our wounding. So sometimes they'll say, well, how do you feel towards that part that's despairing that it can't be perfect? And we'll get, I hate that part. (laughs) I wish that part would just go away. I want to kick that part to the curb. And now what we've got is we've got another part. We've got the part that was despairing initially, but now we've got a part that's hateful towards that part. And, you know, what we do is it's kind of like the more we can invite those parts to kind of take a step back and allow some perspective and some breath, then that's, I, we, we don't call it a part, that soul substance, because it's kind of like the air, right? That's, that can, that can take up the space when the, when the parts aren't quite taking over. So when we've got some self energy there, we can talk to the part and we can speak for the part. Well, this part of me has memories of 
having to be just so my dress had to be perfect or my mom would flip out. Or if I wore something, you know, that didn't look right for church, I would get really the disdain and the, you know, I have, I have early childhood wounding about that. And, and, you know, I feel compassion for this part of myself that holds the wound that experienced the wound via this memory and it's, it's expressing itself that way. And when we hold ourselves with that perspective and with that sensitive sensitivity, right. And that compassion that is inherently healing. And again, it's a verb. So it is a process and it is a relationship. And I think this is what trips people up too, because they're like, you know, I'll hear from clients a lot. I had therapy years ago. I thought I took care of that. Why is it showing back up? And it's not a linear process. You are actually in relationship with that part of you. So if that part of me is a seven-year-old girl inside of me that really got really had a set of series of painful experiences. And I, let's say I established a relationship with her in therapy, maybe 15 years ago, and I've been taking care of her and I thought she was cool, but now suddenly she's acting back up. Well, I have a seven-year-old daughter. I'm a mom of a seven-year-old girl now. So maybe I have more, I just have a new perspective to have to integrate into my system. So it is a relationship with these parts of me and the relationship has changed because I have a new person. I have a seven-year-old daughter who's in here and now that's triggering that part up a little bit more. So I, I have to tell clients a lot, like it's not that you didn't do good work, but this is an ongoing journey. This is not a linear process where it's just done. You're in relationship to those memories and those experiences and those wounds. And again, the question is, no, I'm not going to over-identify with that wound and that wound isn't going to take me down. How am I taking care of that wound? How am I relating to that part of myself that still carries that pain? And when she blends with me, she takes over. You bet I howl and I cry and I still experience some of that pain and I digest a little more of it when I handle it with, when I, when I, when I meet it with that self energy of compassion and care. I know that you need to go in like two minutes, so we need to wrap this up. But I'm wondering, can you give an example of so if someone is coming from the part, what are some things that they would be saying so that people can go like, am I coming from the part or am I speaking for the part? Okay. Yeah. Quick example. This is one that I use a lot. I have a part that gets really mad at my husband. <laughs> and when this part takes me over, I might you know, first of all, my thoughts that I'm thinking are that he's the worst person on the planet and he's such a big jerk. And this part forgets that I chose him voluntarily way back when, <laughs> you know, this part just forgets that perspective. Maybe this part didn't choose him back then. <laughs> Maybe this is the one holdout or something, right? So this part takes over and I might say to my husband, I just want to, you know, give you a taste of your own medicine or, or something like that. And I'm and I'm and I'm yelling, right? And I'm I'm making a mean face and I I'm really activated, right? Versus, you know, if we're talking and I do have perspective on that part of me, and I'm like, oh boy, here she comes. <laughs> I know this one. <laughs> this one's not so sure she maybe ever wanted to be married. And I turn to my husband, and I say, you know what? A part of me just really hates you right now and just wants, you know, wishes I never made this decision to <laughs> hitch our wagons together. You know, so that would be speaking for the part versus speaking from the part. So when I'm speaking from the part, it's like the part has full control over all my faculties. She's the only one here. And she might, she might, I, I don't ever do this actually, but she, she would maybe leave the house, slam the door, right. Or, or make some big ultimatum or, you know, she would take over my body. If I'm able to sit there and breathe and have a little perspective on her and get to know her really well, then I might be able to say, well, that part, I have a part that's so angry with you right now. I could just get up out of here and leave, you know, and that's, that's a, that's actually a really big difference. It's a huge difference. Yeah. I'm a door slammer. <laughs> and as a kid, I was a door slammer. My, my, we've been married 22 years, but I used to, I told him this within the last couple of years, but I used to get mad at him. And when he turned his back to him, I'd flip him off. Ooh. Like I'd be so Pissed yeah, at him. that one I've been known to do. I have insta finger for sure. <laughs> Usually, I'm in keep it under wraps until he turns around. It's terrible. Yeah, it was. It was never at him. It was behind his back. And when I finally told him, like, this is why our relationship works, like he laughed. He just oh, thought like that was so that funny that funny. I'd flip him off. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. So that would be a difference, right? The part would flip off, and then if you're speaking for a part, 
if you're speaking from a part, you're flipping the person off. If you're speaking for a part, you might say, ah, I just feel like giving you the finger right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Jen, because you have to go and I'm very sad, we do need to wrap up. Is there anything that you want to say in closing just to honor your time? I just want to reiterate that wish for the listeners that they can find one person to Marco Polo with and just have this steady stream of, hey, what's your soundtrack sounding like today? And it's normal and it can be held and it's not, it's not something to be, you know, ashamed of. Uh, I just would want that to be like, if I could gift that to everybody and it only takes one person, we don't need everyone in our lives to do this or to get this. The resiliency literature is pretty clear about this. If we just have one person in our lives that can create that space, it begins to model and then it makes it easier for us to do it for ourselves. Yeah. And what it may mean is working with a therapist or a coach first to work through some of the challenges that come up, what I see happening in the online HSP courses. You know, I'm going to hold this because I know you need to go and I can talk about this once we're done. I, I want to respect your time. So. All right, dear one. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here today, Jen. I totally appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Hey there. What I was starting to say when Jen and I needed to end is, what I'm finding with the online HSP courses is when people haven't had a chance to have really authentic interactions, to be around other highly sensitive people, to really understand the trait and to start focusing more inward on what we need. We're so good at trying to figure out what other people are wanting and how to fit in and how to blend because we are part of the minority. And what I see happening in the HSP online courses is people start to get clear about what works for them, what they're needing, starting to own that, and a lot of reality testing going on. And I I just had someone in one of the groups reach out to me yesterday because at the end of group last week, I asked, is anybody feeling like they're getting activated in groups? Because sometimes we have things that get stirred up and we don't even know. And this person said that she got activated the very first night of group. There was somebody in the group that I knew before coming into the group. And so I was a little bit direct with her. And so this person that reached out to me said, I, I've i been kind of thinking about this over the week, and I'm wondering if I offended anybody in group. I'm concerned that I offended you, Patricia. And so we had a really great talk about it. And so she was really taking care of herself that something came up. She felt like it wasn't okay. She reached out, asked for support. We talked about it. Her group is also using Marco Polo, which I'm not getting any money for at this point, which is a little frustrating to me. And they've been communicating via Marco Polo and their group hadn't communicated this week. And because she's having this thought going on, the story she made up in her head was, it's because of what I said, everybody's feeling uncomfortable. And so we talked about how would it be for you to send out a Marco Polo and say, hey, I'm really wanting to get a reality check from everybody. Here's the story I'm making up in my head when I talked about getting activated. I'm concerned that people reacted to that. People are concerned that you know, they're activated too. They had a reaction about what I said to Patricia, would you be willing to give me a reality check on that? And so we processed this together. And she said that she was going to follow up with a Marco Polo to her group to get a reality check. But when we have an experience this, we don't even know what's possible. And what I would imagine may have happened is, and I've had people in group reach out to me that they say something, they share something, they have a vulnerability hangover, they start thinking they shouldn't have said something, they think they hurt my feelings, they think they offended people in the group. This is just stuff that goes on for us as highly sensitive people because we process really deeply. And when we get really vulnerable, we often have what I call a vulnerability hangover. The first time I was a guest on somebody's podcast and I did a Facebook live with someone, I was nauseous. I thought I was going to throw up. Initially, that's what vulnerability looked like. Often a vulnerability hangover looks like thinking about, did I say too much? Did I share too much? How is the other person? We go into this place of self-doubt. And when it's appropriate and we're in environments where we can get a reality check, we can say, hey, this is the story I'm making up in my head. I overshared, I whatever it is. That's how we get intimacy and depth in relationships. So I love Jen's feedback about the value of using Marco Polo, but sometimes we don't even know how how to get those skills because we haven't experienced it. We just haven't lived it, which is what I see happening in the online HSP course is that it's a really safe place. And every week we talk about 
Whatever's going on for you today is okay. If you're feeling tired or irritable or not enough, or you're feeling calm or you're feeling worried, whatever parts of you are showing up are really okay. What do you need and how can we support you in that? So it's not a place where you have to show up and pretend like you've got your shit together. It's a place where you can show up and just be authentically how you are. And I think that many of us don't have that experience of having a safe place where we can show up and talk about whatever's going on without having to monitor or to make sure that people are receiving it okay. It's definitely a process. I feel so strongly about these courses and think that they really can be life-changing to really see what is possible in a relationship. And if we've grown up with people that aren't available to us and give us messages that who we are is not okay, we continue to create relationships that validate that for us because we're trying to work it out. And I think when we, I don't think, when we have the experience of healthy relationships where people can model what we ideally would have gotten from our parents, well-intentioned parents, maybe not well-intentioned parents, not parent bashing, then we know it's possible and then we expect that. The analogy I used with a client yesterday is like, if you had someone who was constantly standing on your foot, what would you say? It's like you'd ask them to get off, but we have people in our lives that, that step on our virtual foot that they're not responsive, they're not able to be vulnerable, they're not able to be authentic, they don't accept and embrace who we are because of their own limitations. People are, are standing on our emotional foot or our spiritual foot, and we don't ask them to get off because we're so accustomed to having people stand on our foot that we don't know that anything else is possible. So that's my big talk. <laughs> I really appreciate each and every one of you. If you want to look at the show notes, you can go to unapologeticallysensitive.com. You can click on the podcast page, go to this episode, click on it, and everything is in the show notes that Jen and I talked about. If you're interested in the online HSP course, go to the HSP tab at that same website. All of my links to social media are there. I have a closed Facebook group called Unapologetically Sensitive. I have an open Facebook page called Unapologetically Sensitive. I really want to change the narrative around sensitivity, knowing that it's a strength, we've got challenges, but we can find this sense of connection and support and really embrace who we are. And I really do my best on social media and in this podcast and in the Facebook group to really create a culture that embraces this, where we can show up and really feel that love and support and connection and have a place to talk about the things that we struggle with and get support around it. I think that's all I have. If you're open to rating and reviewing the podcast, it really helps people find it. If you think this is helpful, share it with a friend. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.